So welcome again. This is uh, question uh, five. This is question five. Sorry, this is question four. Reading my own stuff. Answer any five questions. So this is question four. Explain five factors that might affect a person's ethical behavior at work. Explain five factors that might affect a person's ethical behavior at work. So ethics is basically the ability to differentiate between uh, good and bad or right and wrong and then uh, making a decision or going ahead and doing what is right and what is good. That is when we, we talk of ethical behavior. So the fact that uh, somebody is, um, is uh, ethical simply means that uh, he had a choice to make between good and bad. Uh, or right and wrong and he ended up going for what is good or what is right so there's a choice and uh, uh, he should be in a position to differentiate between good and bad or the right and wrong way and then go ahead and pick what is good or what is right and uh, now depends good or right to who to him to him to, to the society to law all these are various uh, benchmarks that are, have been set basically to help us uh, move in a certain direction or behave in a certain way or carry ourselves within in a within a certain framework of uh, you know the code of uh, conduct so what are some of these factors that might affect a person's ethical behavior at work we'll go uh, Basically, most of these are uh, things that uh, the factors that we are going to discuss here are not necessarily to be found at work because uh, when we talk about ethics, most of them are actually carried outside from work, though there are some that the work itself will also help define. But most of them are innate, they are in the person, and this person basically lives and uh, you know, he has the whole environment both. Uh, outside the workplace and within the workplace that can influence his or her personal uh, ethical behavior. So the first uh, factor that uh, possibly we are going to discuss here uh, is the family, family background, uh, the family background. The family background will determine a lot, uh, uh, a lot on uh, this person's ethical behavior at work. We talk of um, a family that uh, possibly embraces. Uh, we have families that have embraced uh, virtues. They have good. Uh, va we talk of virtues, values. They practice. They live and practice values. And when we talk about about values, these are uh, behaviors that are generally cherished and accepted widely in the society. We talk of things like honesty. We talk of things like uh, you know, fairness, we talk of uh, things like uh, uh, you know, trustworthiness, we talk of transparency, such like stuff. So if this is what the family is upholding as part of the, 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 the family virtues or the platform that uh, the family is built upon, then there are very high chances that this person will also uh, profess the same come to when it comes to his workplace. So the family uh, background will, uh, will uh, determine quite a great deal on the person's ethical behavior at work. If this person has peace at uh, his or her place of uh, residence, her home, then chances are very high that uh, he's also going to, 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 to basically have peace at the place of work. Otherwise, we expect a lot of uh, confusion and conflicts at the place of work if he, died, he or she doesn't enjoy peace at home. So those are, you know, the, 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 generally the way his family background is, or rather how the family uh, has set itself, whether it, or not, the, the, the family practices virtues or values or vices, that is likely to affect his or her performance at the workplace and then uh, we also talk of uh, the societal societal 
virtues or expectations. Let's just talk of the societal expectations. Societal expectations. Uh -huh. What the society uh, expects from uh, this uh, person will also affect his or her ethical behavior at work. The society sets the standards and most of uh, the, 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 the most of the people will try to live to the uh, st uh, standards that have been set by the society. So we expect them to behave in a certain way at their workplace just to reach the standards that have been set by the uh, society. And this possibly is al almost related to cultural, uh, cultural, uh, we can talk of the cultural values. Uh, they also have an impact on uh, the person's ethical behavior at work because there are some things that are allowed culturally there are some things that are not allowed and of course these things might affect uh, his workplace in one way or his behavior at the workplace in one way or the other we also have his personal ambition personal ambition ambition if this person is of ambitious uh, then chances are that it might also affect his or her ethical behavior at work where possibly he wants to get rich quick and in the process he might end up uh, doing some things which may not go well at the workplace like uh, theft and uh, you know misrepresentation those are some of the unethical behaviors that might come uh, back on him when this person is not uh, uh, or when the person is over ambitious where he wants to acquire a lot within the shortest period of time the company ethos uh, or code of conduct company ethos or code of conduct code of conduct will also help shape this person's ethical behavior at work because this basically will have the do's and the uh, and the don'ts and of course this go a great deal in shaping how this employee should carry himself or herself at the workplace. The professional uh, professional uh, groupings or belonging, the, the, the professional groupings or belonging can also help shape the behavior of the employees at the workplace, especially when uh, what we mean by this is uh, if this employee belongs to a certain professional group, like we talk of uh, IHRM, we talk of uh, ISPAC, we talk of LSK, if our uh, engineers board of Kenya, engineers, yeah, such like professional groupings, that if you belong in any of these professional groupings, then these professional groups will require you to carry yourself in a certain dignified manner that is a uh, commensurate or uh, that is expected of a member of their profession and that might also go a long way in shaping the behavior of this uh, person at the place of work uh, then uh, possibly we'll also have the personal conscience of the person personal conscience of the person what the the the, the person basically believes in personal conscience and this is a does he uh, do the good acts for the sake of others for the sake of others or for the sake of himself is he principled people who are principled are likely to do good for the sake of their own uh, personal conscience and like people who are uh, basically they, 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 they do stuff good things to win the favors of others so that's the the, the, the fact that uh, the, the this ethics is in it and owned by this person will go a long way in uh, in uh, determining how he's going to behave at the place of work so whether people are looking at people are seeing what he's doing or not and uh, or whether there will be punishment at the end of it all or there will be a reward 
I mean, this all may not be the reason why this person is doing uh, the, 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 the good or right things. If it comes from deep inside him, then it will be better. So we are looking at the mindset of this person. Why is he doing what is, what is good or what is, why is he not doing what is bad? If it's because of his personal decision, then that might go a long way in ensuring sustainability. So we look also at the person's conscience or mindset person's conscience or mindset what does he believe in or personal belief that can go a long way in shaping the ethical behavior at the workplace so we have the family background we have the societal expectation the cultural values we have the personal ambition we have the company ethos we have the professional groupings we have the personal conscience and uh, Perhaps we can also talk of uh, the can talk of the political affiliations, political affiliations at the place of work. Whom does he know? Uh, you know, sometimes it's all about where you are placed in terms of uh, in the organization. So if you know people of influence, that can also go a long way in determining you how you are going to carry yourself at the place of work as opposed to if you don't know the who is who the people in power or something it's a common tendency for people who are closer to people of power to misuse uh, that advantage and end up behaving unethically as opposed to to or ethically it can be either way you can choose to behave ethical ethically or unethically so it depends with how uh, the, 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 the relationship is and the effect of that uh, relationship. So with that, I think uh, these are so many points. Just pick any five and we'll be good to go. All these are uh, uh, factors might affect a person's ethical behavior at work. They might decide whether they, uh, they determine whether this person will behave ethically or unethically. The instead for benefits of registering a trademark. This is question B1. Benefits of registering a trademark. What are some of the benefits of registering a trademark? Number one, the ability to protect your brand, protect your brand from counterfeits. Counterfeits. You'll be able to protect your brand from counterfeits. At least you'll be able to reduce uh, counterfeits to a greater extent. Because uh, the brand is associated with you, and just the fact that you own that brand, you can institute legal proceedings against anybody who uh, institute legal proceedings against. This is another point against anybody who misuses it or uses it against your uh, your 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 express uh, consent. So you might always institute legal proceedings. So it gives you the powers to own that uh, trademark in totality and you can institute legal proceedings against anybody who uses it uh, without your consent. Generally, a, trad a trademark is just a, it's, it's like a word uh, symbol. Uh, a word uh, symbol, it can be a, a name basically that uh, describes your, your, your product and the right way is that uh, you need to have registered it so that uh, before saying that you own it and that, that once you own it these benefits will now come uh, trickling to your side so benefits of registering a trademark we've already said it helps protect your brand it helps protect your brand from counterfeits then it gives you the ability to institute legal proceedings against anybody who goes uh, who uses it without your express will it also gives you the ex exclusive rights exclusive rights it gives you the exclusive rights to be the registered owner and to be the user to be the registered user who can pass the title even to other uh, generations to come so once you, you have registered it, you have the exclusive rights, 
and you can even make money from that. You can enter into contracts with other uh, investors or people who want to use that trademark for business purposes. That basically means it has, by registering it, it can empower you uh, to a greater extent. Then uh, the, 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 the other reason why you need to register it, it is uh, to register a trademark is so that uh, you can, so that you may not have, you may not have to provide proof of ownership, to, to provide any other proof of ownership, any other proof of ownership of the trademark to anybody, to anybody, because once you have registered it, that is enough. And there will be no any other uh, trademark that will be anywhere closer to your trademark. Because normally before a trademark is registered, it goes through a Tara search. There should be no any trademark that is very close or similar to an already registered trademark. And that's an advantage. It simply means that you'll be the sole owner of that trademark and you can use it to your level uh, to the best advantage possible. The trademark also can be a selling point. It's used to distinguish or identify your product, to distinguish or identify your product. And this is something that is very good, especially when you're talking about a product that does well. It basically adds to the value of the company in terms of goodwill and in terms of uh, reputation. In terms of goodwill, in terms of reputation. And basically, people uh, see companies that uh, have uh, a registered trade trademark as being companies that are orderly, companies that know what, they know what they are doing, companies that are a going concern. So this uh, could just be some of the, uh, the, 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 the reason. And actually, this goodwill and, repu and reputation can also qualify to be another point, uh, to be a different point on their own. So you can just pick any four here. I think the examiner wanted four benefits. So just pick any four benefits from this and we'll be good to go. So we proceed, identify three works that are eligible for copyright. Identify three works that are eligible for uh, copyright. So copyright is a, is a right that is given to uh, to talk of documentary work so that you are, whatever it is that you have done is protected from other people who might want to benefit from what they have done for a considerable period of time. So once you do your artistic work, we talk of artistic work, artistic work, we talk of uh, documentary work, uh, music, all this you can go for. The, 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 the copyright basically is a, a right given to you to that so that nobody else can use this your documentary work or your artistic work or your music to further his or her prospects at your expense. So it's protected. This basically your piece of work is protected for you so that you can basically recover all the costs that you incurred in coming up with that piece of work and get the, 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 the benefits that will come with that particular piece of work. Now the question is, identify three works that are eligible for copyright. There are so many. We'll start with, say, literal, uh, the lit, this is literature, literary work, literature, literary work. Then we have already said we have the documentary work, any document that you come up with. We have the musical works, musical works. For example, you come up with uh, the, some uh, songs. Then we have the dramatic works, including poems, dramatic works, including poems, uh, pictorial works, pictorial, graphical works. All these are uh, different works that uh, are eligible for copyright. All these are eligible for uh, copyright. So we've said we have documentary, artistic, musical works, literary works, dramatic works, including poems, pictorial, graphical works, 
uh, uh, this possibly will go with paintings. Paintings can also fall under here. Paintings, uh, photographic works, photographic works. So all these, just pick any three and you'll be good to go. All these are works that are eligible for copyright. Even sound recordings. Sound recordings, we talk about musical works, but this one can also appear here, sound recordings. All these are legible for copyright. Okay, let's move to the last uh, question. Question uh, 4C. Question 4C. Let me delete this, get some space for uh, working for... So, question 4C. One minute, we delete this. Let's create some space. Okay, describe the five features of a higher purchase. Describe the five features of a higher purchase. Now, a higher purchase is a contract. <coughs> Normally, uh, it has two uh, parties. We have the higher, have the higher, and we have the higher. Then it involves a, a payment of deposits, deposits, and uh, the initial deposits, let's talk of uh, it involves payment of initial deposits and then the subs, the remaining amount is uh, the remaining, then the remaining balance is paid in, 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 in installments. So you have to you agree on uh, an initial deposit or down payment and then the remaining amount will be paid in installments it can be monthly installments let's just talk of periodic installments now the once the 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 the, the higher once uh, the, the the deposit is paid once the deposit is paid the possession possession uh, uh possession moves to the buyer once the deposit is paid, the possession moves to the buyer, uh, the buyer of the, the new owner, that is, of the, 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 the whatever the item we are buying. But the ownership, so possession changes, changes our hands, it moves to the buyer, and then the ownership is retained by who? by the seller the ownership is retained by the seller <laughs> so the 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 deposit is paid once the deposit is paid possession moves to the buyer who is now the higher But you will not have the ownership. Ownership is retained by the seller who is the hiree. Okay. When will the, 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 the ownership change? The ownership will change. Ownership will transfer to the buyer upon the last pay, the, 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 uh, upon the payment upon payment of the last installment of the last installment so once the last installment is paid ownership will be transferred to the buyer so that the buyer will have both the possession and the ownership it's only possible once the last installment is paid before the last installment is paid ownership is retained with the seller and possession will be assumed by the buyer so the buyer is allowed to 
use the, 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 the said object or property uh, as the contract uh, is still in force. So we've uh, already said that payments are all, uh, all payments are made in installments, and then uh, we've talked about the possession, which goes to the buyer immediately. Uh, ownership, we've said, remains with the seller, and then there is also this bit that the seller can repossess. The seller can repossess the object in question the goods or the object in question should the buyer fail to meet his part of the bargain or should the buyer fail to to meet his monthly installments so if he fails to uh, play his part of the bargain the seller can repossess the goods in question until the payment is done the the the, the, the installments uh, are paid then uh, something else that all the installments that are paid all the installments that are paid that are paid will be treated will be treated as as uh, uh, charges charges for the use of the product because uh, every day the buyer is using the product in question so whatever installments he pays will be will go towards uh, you know will be treated as charges for his uh, ability to use the product when the contract has not even uh, has not been has not come to the end of uh, of it. Though nowadays it's uh, uh, when the the buyer fails to pay and he has gone a long way in terms of servicing the the the, the contract the court might always want to find out uh, the, the, the extent of uh, damages and then it will determine who to pay what as opposed to like what was happening some time back where you, if the buyer fails to pay even if you talk about the last installment then he loses the entire uh, the, 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 the whole object plus what he had paid so far then uh, what else can we say normally there is a before you enter into this contract cash price should always cash cash price cash price is always indicated on the object cash price is always indicated and the higher purchase price to the higher purchase price to this is a mandatory it's uh, required the higher purchase price normally has some interest charge so the higher purchase price will always have some interest charge as opposed to the cash price so the cash price is lower the higher purchase price is always higher because of the interest charge so what have we said that it involves two uh, key players the higher and the higher which are also the seller and the buyer and then the higher purchase contracts are always uh, highly charged compared to the cash price because there are some interests which are charged at a flat rate and then the payments are done in form of deposit and periodic installments the ownership of the goods will be transferred upon the last uh, upon the, the the payment of the last installment possession will be assumed immediately after you've entered into this contract the buyer will assume possession but not the ownership uh, and uh, we've also said that it's possible for the seller to repossess the goods should the buyer not be in a position to meet his part of the bargain so all these are uh, the features or characteristics of a high purchase contract you can just pick any five and state them uh, with of course some few uh, line uh, uh, explanations to help you get these five marks so thank you let's meet in the next lesson